Thank you all for showing up. Um, again, my name is Shane Meyer. I am part of the Nature Conservancy's Farmer Advocate Program we started last year. Um, and uh, they've tasked us with going out and uh, trying to recruit people for these style of meetings, some one-on-one, -on -one, some face-to-face. -face. And uh, um, this is one that uh, Dave and Jay Brandt offered to help me out and put a in-depth deep dive into single species uh, cover crops. Um, we're going to do uh, talking about individual single species within families of cover crops. So we've got four of these sessions that we're going to do, as you probably saw, we're going to start at 730 on the fourth Thursday of every month through April, starting with today. And uh, we're going to dive deep into individual families. So tonight we'll be on grasses. And uh, Dave and Jay have put together a presentation. They've sure they've done this in the past, so they know what they're doing. Uh, instead of listening to me ramble and ask questions, I will try and interject some questions here tonight um, that maybe all of you are thinking um, as we go forward within these species, but we're gonna try and hit on the individual species, um, population, um, planting depth, um, a positive planting uh, form, whether it be broadcast or drilled if one is preferred over the other, um, incorporation, if it's broadcast, what would be our best incorporation? Um, some of them are lightly incorporated, some of them probably a little heavier. And that's the kind of stuff that we're hoping to get into here tonight. So um, I'm glad to see all of you here. I do see a couple of names that I know. So, um, and it looks like there's a couple of farmer advocates themselves also. So, um, from Don McClure, I just see a chat right here. Will you also be talking about herbicides that will ding the cover crops? We can get into that. Um, a lot of times, uh, some of the answer, uh, as Dave or Jay will probably say, is we need to look into our label, right? Uh, labels are pretty in-depth these days, but uh, yes, I'm sure that they've got a little bit more expertise on, on some of that information. And uh, if uh, there is specifics that you're looking for, uh, there is a wide array of people that these guys work with, that these guys know that we can be asking some questions um, and get back with you. So have I kind of missed anything there, Dave or Jay? No, I think you covered it pretty good there, Shane. All right, well, I'm not gonna ramble very long. I'm gonna let these guys get started. <laughs> Um, I, I'm going to, uh, add a couple of links in the chat, uh, just some generic, um, links that you guys can probably find on your own, but they're great eye candy, um, when you're looking at this kind of stuff. So, uh, I will go ahead and let Dave and Jay get started, introduce themselves, anything else they want to add to it. Um, and, uh, I guess let me take one step back. Uh, I did say I'm part of the Farmer Advocate Program. I'm up here in Northwest Ohio. And uh, the reason I got into this program was uh, I've transitioned uh, one farm that my wife and I own to organics. And uh, I've been stripped till since 2007. And to go to organics is a lot more tillage that I'm not used to. And uh, I met Jay and his wife and um, in 2019 at a meeting up in Michigan, and uh, instantly I wanted to talk with them about uh, using cover crops to help cover my soil since uh, I'm doing more tillage than what I'm used to. And uh, it led into a pretty great relationship that we've had over the last couple of years. And uh, um, all the questions that I've posed over these last two or three years, I'm hoping to bring out within this program so that you guys can kind of get a good idea of some of the questions that I've asked as I've transitioned into the cover crop world. So, um, so yeah, with that, I'll let it go back to Dave and Jay and introduce themselves and go forward. 
Well, good evening. Uh, this is David. And uh, a little history to start this off with is uh, we've been no-tilling since uh, our first field was in 69. We was 100% no-till in 1971. The picture of the farm you see here has been no-tilled since 1973 and never been tilled. Uh, it's had cover crops on it uh, every year, except the years that we have uh, uh, soybeans uh, going to wheat. Uh, we just don't have time to get a cover crop in between the soybean harvest and wheat planting. But after wheat, we always put a fairly uh, highly species cover crop in to uh, bring lots of nutrients to the surface. So uh, this is our home base of operation. Uh, we own 160 acres and we ran about 800 more. Back in uh, 2013, we had the opportunity to expand our seed business. Uh, Dad was selling a little bit of seed for, uh, what was that? Uh, for Steve Groff and his group yeah, out right. there. Uh, so we decided to expand that operation as we were getting into more diverse seed mixes and carrying a wider variety of seeds. So uh, my wife and I moved our family down back to the farm to run that seed business and also to expand uh, the crop production here on the farm to grow some of the cereal grains that we sell as well, primarily the cereal rye, some oats, uh, barley, and the triticale uh, as the season goes. We do contract grow some of them as well and are always looking for partners in that uh, area there. So we've had the opportunity not only from traveling with different meetings, but through our own experience uh, that we can offer then pretty good advice and help to those getting started with using cover crops. And that's an extension of this here. So uh, a little bit of note there, the two grandsons of Jay's, the oldest one is Chris. So he has the uh, green uh, short sleeve shirt on and the one beside him is Isaac. Uh, Chris came back to the farm uh, two and a half, three years ago, and Isaac came back about four months ago. And it's really a privilege to have uh, the, your grandkids here, my grandkids here, uh, helping Grandpa bend over and get things done. So it's been a real blessing to uh, have the fourth generation here on the farm. Yep. And the key thing that we want to stress and why we are so excited to partner with Shane and the Nature Conservancy is really to, again, promote uh, the principles of soil health and how we use these different species of plants to really go and maintain the quality of our soils and to preserve our farms for the future generations. Again, so again, to use the four principles, mainly uh, continuous living roots, minimizing disturbance, maximizing soil cover and maximizing diversity in our operations. So we kind of keep those four key uh, ideas in our minds as we proceed forward. And again, healthy soils do, you know, what these bullet points help us uh, explain here. Cycle nutrients, store carbon, aeration of the soil, resiliency and profitability of the farms, yield stability, uh, specifically in our case, how we got started in cover crops was to reduce runoff and erosion. We improve water storage and again, primarily be resilient in drought through that to suppress disease and pest problems. These are the key benefits of all these uh, different grasses that we'll be talking about today and our practice. Uh, you know, one big thing that I noticed being a farm production guy is that as we went to uh, grass species and, and also some legume species, but today we're going to talk about grasses, is our infiltration rates are up to where we can infiltrate about six inches of water an hour presently on our farm. And that's a, that's a real plus because uh, we don't have the runoff uh, from the surface to move, those, uh, move the soil and also to move our nutrients into the stream. So that's a, been a real plus for us. So this is my Neighbors conventional, uh, just, you know, I just had to throw this in there that, uh, you know, it's already been fall tilled. It looks like this. Uh, uh, he keeps telling me about how much more water he can infiltrate. Uh, we did an infiltration study on his farm here 
and he can infiltrate after the tillage about a half an inch an hour. So, you know, he didn't really help infiltration. And then we end up with, he ends up with this problem in the spring where he's losing 30 to 40 ton from real erosion. And then he's out there in the spring with the greater blade or a bulldozer filling in these ruts, you know. And this is one of the big things that grasses can really do is to reduce this real erosion because of, you know, the, the very dense root systems that grasses have. So they, even a small seeding rate can really help stabilize your soil in these uh, rain events. So as we stole this uh, slide from Don Rakowski, again, <laughs> uh, give credit where credit's due on that. But uh, again, the concept here is minimizing disturbance. And, you know, to the people that are involved in organic agriculture, their challenge then is to stabilize and minimize, right, carbon loss through uh, the CO2 evolution here in the tillage pass. And so that's just the point here that, you know, we promote no-till because that's our practice. And that's just one of the tools that we use uh, in that practice. So there's other ways we can minimize the, the amount of disturbance by reducing the severity, right? As a, not doing a full inversion tillage as an example here, but doing other types that can help reduce that. Uh, sometimes it's needed uh, and in certain practices, it's needed more than others. And we recognize that and just encourage those practices to help heal the soils as we continue on there. So this is a picture of a, uh, one of the neighbors open ditches that's right across the road from us after a two and a half inch rainfall event uh, that happened in about 35 minutes. In other words, it, it fell out of five gallon buckets seemed like, you know, and this was the amount of erosion and look at the color of the water in his uh, uh, creek there and also the erosion on the side of the hill. This is right after he planted corn. Go ahead, Jane. Then this is right across the road from him. This is an 80 acre field with cover crops and look at the difference in the amount of water that's not there, but the water you see is clear. So here, this is a proven fact that we can actually slow down the erosion, increase water infiltration with the grasses that we're trying to talk about this evening. Another big thing with grasses is, is the weed suppression, just from the competition for sunlight and the fact that we can get them established in the fall before your winter annuals get established, right? So the benefit with grasses, they're quick to germinate and the canopy, we can have very high biomass, right? The crowding. Allelopathy is the, when the plant gives off different chemicals in the soil to prevent other plants from germinating. We see this mainly with small seeded broadleaves are affected mostly. Uh, and so we have several of the cool season grasses that have this property. And as I mentioned, they, they compete for those resources of sunlight, water, and nitrogen. Uh, and they can aid right in the, as long as we get the proper timing when these cover crops are established. And timing is important here because the earlier in the fall, if you're in a corn bean rotation, uh, the earlier you can get these uh, grass crops in, uh, the more fibrous roots they have, uh, they get up to three to four inches tall. If you're planting on Thanksgiving Day, which is, you know, you can plant and have it grow, but they're only an inch, inch and a half tall. They're kind of uh, rusty red looking color and not a whole lot of roots. So timing is a real important thing to make these cover crops uh, uh, do what we want them to do in our operation. So that's a, that's a good um, starting point for me to ask a question. I love this term allopathy, but it's thrown out there so much that I don't think we really understand um, the effects of it, right? How, how thick must a cover crop be planted in order for the allopathy to properly work? You know, are we talking um a uh, single species can it be in a blend um does it need to be thick uh does it and i know you know it can go uh, either way on uh on different uh varieties annual rye grass or cereal rye or something like that you know what i'm saying but uh does it have to be thick for that allopathy to work or can we get it with uh you know a very diverse mix 
I think Shane, that's a good question. You know, I we've played with this, and we're going to talk mainly about cereal rye going to soybeans. You know, uh, I don't like to use too much grass crops going to corn because uh, corn is a warm season grass. So there is some competition between a grass cover crop and a getting a corn crop up. Uh, but, you know, you look at rye uh, soon early in the fall at uh, 30 to 40 pounds, you'll get a nice allopathic effect. You won't get that effect in October or in August or November around Thanksgiving because it's just not that big. So that's when you have to increase the seeding rates, you know. Um, uh, if you're talking about organics, of course, you're going to be probably three times higher than that to suppress the weeds for the annual suppression that you want. Uh, we'll get good suppression in the spring, but then as you get close to August, if it's thin, like 30 pounds, you will get some weed escapes if you're trying to do it as an organic farmer, you know. Right, just okay. to reiterate, uh, I think we have plenty of evidence as well from uh, some university trials, both at Ohio State and places like uh, Madison, Wisconsin campus that talk about you can get wheat suppression, as we mentioned, around 30 pounds of rye uh, sown early in, uh, say, early would be mid to late October, right? And uh, that helps with that, uh, for as just to reiterate, if for organic weed suppression, you'll need to be around three bushel of rye, uh, just to, because there's that amount of biomass that we're looking to get around 8,000 pounds, which is that over competition for sunlight and the, uh, the, the chemicals from the roots in suppressing germination in both cases. And if I'm you want to talk about annual rye grass, uh, it probably is going to be between 15 and 20 pounds. Uh, going to be really nice going into winter, but a lot of times we'll lose 40 to 60 percent of that rye grass because of winter kill, and then you'll end up with bare places in the field in the spring that you do have problems uh, with with the escapes of the broadleaves. You know. So, so will that allopathy, the chemicals from the roots, will they stay after you terminate, say roller cramp or uh, herbicide termination? Will they still be there for some time? So no, but those are generally what we talk about in the active growing stages. So excreted so, during the living time right, of the, right. the plant. So, okay. And once the plant goes reproductive, then we're going to change the uh, types of chemicals from the roots. And it, so that's why uh, as the plant, those grasses senesce, you tend to get weed pressure because that allelopathy has passed. Okay. All right. A lot of the talks we do are based on observation of this uh, cover crop table that was developed by the uh, NRCS group. I believe this is one of the links that uh, Shane is going to provide for you, and they have on the uh, NRCS website a link to this cover crop table, and it's a very large uh, PDF file with some good descriptions of these different cover crops. We're going to focus on the two outside columns of grasses, both cool and warm season today, and work through a number of these. Starting with uh, the cool season grasses, which are some that we are most familiar with and generally have a lot of utility in the broad acre crops that we're most common with here, uh, corn and soybeans. Uh, we do have different times of planting seasons, right? So some spring varieties are good in the spring and for fall. We noticed that the cereal rye has probably the most broad adaption in regards to late planting and survivability. So this gives you kind of a concept of the seed size in regards to seeds per pound. And we see that annual ryegrass has quite a number of seeds, which is what we're familiar with, with true grasses versus the cereal grains that we show in the rest of the chart. So let me ask the question everybody wants to know, how late can I go with my cereal rye seeding? Let's call it broadcast. We're just trying to get it out there last minute as far as we can get it. We've sowed an awful lot of rye at Thanksgiving time. Uh, you know, we're probably in the 70, 80 pound range doing that, especially if you're going to broadcast it, because only about 60% of it's going to grow because the rest of it's up on the surface. Uh, you won't see much of it till spring. That's a disappointing part when you do that because uh, 
guys will spread it to a week, two or three weeks, and they'll call up and say, there's nothing growing out here. And, and you know, we may go see the fella to see if, if we can uh, uh, senesce him a little bit and say, yeah, there's something out there. And we'll walk out in the field and you'll find little uh, orangey or uh, light red spikes sticking up and that's a rye growing and it don't show up very well in a corn fodder field, you know, or in a wheat or a <clears throat> oats or uh, a beans, a beans double field. So those are the things we see. It will work clear up to Thanksgiving. You'll get a lot more benefit out of it if you can get it done in all, uh, October. Uh, but, you know, those are the things. Sometimes you just can't get it done. You know, we'll drill as much as we can if we get to the 15th of November. Guess what, people? Put it in a fertilizer spreader and blow it out there and get it done because the weather's going to change. If it gets rainy and, and uh, fluctuates up and down in temperatures, it'll come right out of the ground. You know, so it don't have to be in very deep. Nope. And what our, our experience on our farm is that that time after Thanksgiving through January is probably not a really good time to broadcast. We generally have a lot of winter kill, especially here in central Ohio. We get a lot of temperature cycling. And if uh, the ride does happen to uh, germinate, sometimes, especially with the, the ice, and, and freezing temperatures, we do get a lot of winter kill that way. So generally, if we don't get it done by the 1st of December, we'll wait until uh, early spring, say late February, early March, before we broadcast anymore, just to provide the, the best opportunity. We see a lot of, of winter death loss if we try to apply in late December and January most of the time. Well, this is just a shot of <clears throat> annual ryegrass. Uh, you know, it grows fast. Uh, it has, it really does have deep roots. It's a really good forage if you happen to have livestock. You know, they could be out there uh, clear into January, February eating that ryegrass. Uh, it's prone to winter kill. <clears throat> it has a lower <clears throat> CNN to ratio rather than rye because it's not as tall. And uh, it does help. Uh, it does help with the weed suppression, but it also, if you let it get too big in the spring before you terminate it, it can become a weed. Hard to control. Right. So annual ryegrass, again, does not establish well when it's very cold. So generally late October is probably the, the preferred late uh, seeding date. So generally we recommend annual ryegrass broadcast into the standing crop for best success uh, if you're doing late harvest, right? So, and a lot of guys will then broadcast annual rye grass in the spring because as a, a true grass, a generally a broadcast, it doesn't take much seed to soil contact for a, a decent annual rye grass establishment at rates as low as eight, 10 pounds per acre. Yeah, and this picture shows that this rye grass was seeded <clears throat> while the corn was still standing because you can see the corn row with not very much Right grass in the row of corn fodder. So the other eight to ten pounds. Yep, that would be the minimum, right? Yep. yep. Okay, and that would be broadcast with light incorporation. I would just broadcast it'll grow. Broadcast I, would it'll I would not do anything to disturb the soil surface. No, you don't like it. Doesn't need it. Don't need it. Like grass really does well broadcast. Uh, annual rye grass, especially. So we'll talk about some other applications for broadcasting annual ryegrass a little later as well. Okay. The big challenge with annual ryegrass is termination in the spring. Uh, so a lot of guys that are where annual ryegrass is really popular say by the time they're mowing their grass the second time in their front yard, they're running the sprayer out and burning it off. Uh, annual ryegrass grows really quickly in the spring. Uh, and so you can miss that easy opportunity for termination because once it starts to flower, uh, then it will absorb the chemical very slowly and it's very slow to die. Uh, so corn, especially planted into annual ryegrass, will struggle quite a bit. Yep. Uh, and you may actually have to replant. So we've experienced that personally yep. on our side. So we like to let cover crops grow tall and that generally means uh, a couple of passes with uh, Roundup, uh, Clethodum, Paraquat, Liberty. Those are all options for annual ryegrass. You want to use a tank conditioner. Citric acid, uh, we generally recommend to make that 
uh, glyphosate especially very hot and very effective. And looking at this picture, if this wouldn't have been, if this wouldn't be a fall picture, and you can imagine there's leaves on those trees, this is about the right size that ryegrass terminates really easy. If it gets much bigger than this, it's a, it's a real problem to get it controlled uh, because it's going to that reproduction stage and uh, you can burn the top off, but it doesn't seem to get to the roots because uh, the plant's actually in reverse. It's moving nutrients to make the seed head and not taking it down to the root. That's why we have trouble killing it when it gets bigger. Hey, I just had a direct question asked to me in the chat. Um, Aaron, you can hop on here and uh, ask a, a little more in depth if you want, but he's asking, can a guy intercede with the high boy earlier? say end of August, to get grass off to a quicker start. You mentioned 30 to 40 pounds for weed suppression, but what is what rate is recommended if you're going to plan on grazing over winter and early spring? So Aaron, are, what, are you asking about a specific grass? Or are you asking um, for a recommendation on what to plant and the seeding rate? I guess to start answering this question, <clears throat> I'd probably be looking at 15 pound of ryegrass. Uh, blending on with a high boy works really well in August because the bottom three or four leaves are already starting to turn a little yellow. You're going to get some sunlight down there. Uh, uh, you know, if you're planting 40,000 plants and it's still green, it may take that ryegrass a month to get established just because it can't find enough sunlight. It's dark down in there. Uh, but, you know, it'll still come. Uh, if you're looking at rye, I would probably be looking at 60 pounds the acre if you're going to broadcast it on with a high boy. Right. So yeah. that's, yeah, especially if you're going to do grazing with animals, right? So we'll want to look more closely at recommended grazing seeding rates. So those are, are well established. Uh, the uh, pneumatic equipment that we use for seeding through a high boy generally can't handle that high a seeding rate. So uh, we, we try to do the best you can with that equipment, uh, as well as, you know, the airplane generally can only put on so much as well on that. So that is as high as we can go, that 60 to 70 pounds is yeah. a really good number. Annual ryegrass, of course, because there's so many seeds, uh, we really don't need to go above 20 pounds of annual ryegrass. That is a lot That's of a lot. grass yeah. uh, for annual ryegrass. Yeah. And just to like point out what he's saying, annual ryegrass is 215,000 seeds per pound, you know, right. whereas cereal rye is 18,000. Yes. So that's why they're saying such a low rate of the annual ryegrass because there's going to be so many seeds out there to begin with right. on yep. a per pound basis. Yes. So um, we do have a chart in some of our literature from walnut creek seeds um that we'll try and get out to you guys via email or something and it gives you the different rates for you know a single uh, species a mix or a forage you know something like that so that's kind of where these guys are getting their numbers from yep yep the last benefit we'll say for annual ryegrass is really if you've got uh compaction annual ryegrass is an excellent selection for shallow compaction especially uh Indiana and Illinois, especially, they have this area in the southern part of the state where they get what they call a fragipan. And annual ryegrass has shown to be very effective in breaking up that fragipan layer, which uh, can cause those uh, tomahawk roots in uh, corn plants, especially. So it really opens up that soil profile and provides a way for your cash crop to get established and have a very resilient root structure. So that's a big advantage in annual ryegrass low cost. And uh, like I said, a lot of guys, if you got your own sprayer, especially, and you can manage that termination is a really effective and high quality cover crop. This is just a shot of the ryegrass uh, that we burnt down. Uh, we like to make sure it's dead on our farm before we start to plant. Uh, gives us the opportunity then if it's not, we can come back and treat it again. I don't like to say we like to use a lot of herbicides. Uh, and that's one reason we, I am not a big fan of ryegrass. It just takes so much chemical to get rid of it that I would rather use rye, cereal rye, 
and use a crop roller to terminate it. Go ahead. Yeah, and again, because we like to let stuff get big. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> then it's, so it's our fault. Right. Uh, <clears throat> other good cover crops in the spring or in the fall or even in the summer, it's surprising. I never thought oats would grow at 90 degree weather uh, in a cover crop in, uh, in August planted behind wheat. But uh, oats are really a great uh, cover crop. They grow well, uh, a great feed source if you're gonna pasture it. Uh, any type of animal likes it. It's easy to establish, it's easy to manage. And 99 times out of 100, the winner will kill it, you know. Uh, so I really like oats. I've not done a lot of work with black oats. Uh, they're a southern winter oat. They claim they would survive the winter in southern, you know, down in the Carolinas. But remember, the Carolinas hardly ever get any snow or freezing weather. So the soil never gets to, to where it's uh, frozen. Uh, it has a larger leaf area. Uh, it has a great way to suppress weeds. And it's adaptable in really poor soils. You know, seems to respond well to poor or managed soils. Yep. So that's the key difference. Uh, we talked about <coughs> oats in general. We refer to just uh, a white spring oat. That's what we're familiar with here in Ohio. Occasionally, we will see some over winter, uh, but that's rather unusual. Uh, black oats, we have had some folks with mild winters here in Ohio have those over winter. The big thing that we like oats for, again, is that easy spring management because of winter kill. So for oats to terminate in the winter, we really like to see three or four days in the low to mid 20s. Uh, that's really what we need to terminate oats in the winter. We also like to see oats in a, in a mix or in a field, especially a field coming from conventional tillage and you're trying to adapt uh, to either uh, organic farming or regenerative farming. Oaks seem to be one of the fastest hosts for mycorrhiza. Uh, they seem to bring mycorrhiza back or make it develop or whatever. Maybe it was in the soil and it just has, the roots have something that the mycorrhiza likes, but we see more mycorrhiza association as we use oats the first year or two coming out of a conventional farming situation. What would you say oats are probably one of the easiest to manage with the winter kill? They'll, they'll winter kill one of the easiest? Correct. Yep. So that's, again, one of the, the great selling points about oats. Uh, is that e they, in the past, they've been economical. <laughs> All right. uh, that, that winter, that easy management. Because, again, uh, the residue is fairly persistent from the winter kill. So you get really good... Uh, protection against spring erosion, but by the time you're ready to plant, there's very little interference at all with any kind of planting system from that standpoint. So the benefit there, uh, you get that nutrient cycling really quick from the oats, uh, and no interference in your planting practices uh, because the residue disappears very quickly. So what is probably the only disadvantage I see to oats is if you get them a little bit too thick during the summertime and they get three to four foot tall, and they winter kill, they fall down tight against the soil. And it's really hard for the sunlight and wind on early spring days to dry that soil out with just oats in that mix, because it's just like you put a canvas, a perforated canvas over the soil where you let the water go in, but you can't get any sunlight or air to help dry out the surface, you know. So what, what does the root mass look on an oat plant? Is it as tall or as deep as it is tall, like a rye plant would be? Or is it more like a, uh, a cereal rye or a rye grass where it's deeper than it is tall? Like how does, what does the root system look like on an oat? Yeah, so it, again, I think it's going to be very similar to yeah. the size of the oat plant growing, right? So it's a very fibrous root system. It's not exceptionally deep. The, the main benefit to the oats is that it's going to build that, that top 12 to 24 inches of soil, bring back the aggregation because of the dense root system so that you get good water uh, infiltration in the top 24 inches.
Triticale is a hybrid of cereal rye and wheat that was developed primarily as a forage crop so that you get the uh, winter hardiness of the rye crop and you get the forage quality of wheat. So there are both spring and winter varieties and there are both varieties, what we call facultative, which means they could be planted spring or winter. So it's a very unique uh, type of small grain. It is generally higher costing from a seed per pound, a cost you know, of seed per pound standpoint. Uh, but again, if you're grazing or using it as a forage to be harvested in the spring, you have a higher feed value, so it balances out very well. Um, I have a statement that it's somewhat less versatile than rye because it is somewhat susceptible to winter kill with late planting, just like wheat would be from that standpoint where you get either the, the freezing of the crown or you just get such less tillering uh, that you don't get very good weed suppression. Triticale does not carry over as much of the allelopathy from the rye, but because of the biomass, you do get the shading and the competition for resources. Uh, Triticale has been really bred to consume dairy manure, so it is highly efficient at pulling nitrogen from the soil. So it really helps compete against weeds, especially broadleaf weeds, by pulling out the, the nitrogen and holding it in the residue. Real quick. Part, yeah, the Real other part quick. of triticale is that it, it matures later than rye. So if you want to use a roller crimper to mechanically terminate, you'll be another five or 10 days after rye, which will put you into mid to late June for mechanical termination on triticale. I had a question here in the chat come in. Um, when do you plant oats to use as a food source before it winter kills? So if you're going to grow up for seed, how, soon, how early do you want to plant that, that oat seed? So oats can be planted, I think, in early August. Uh, primarily, a lot of gentlemen with cattle will do that and either uh, wet wrap uh, or dry bale it if they can get in between the rain from that standpoint. So yeah, it's a, becoming back again, very popular after wheat uh, to, su to support uh, hay production in the fall and early to mid August planting, which should give you a good opportunity to get off three to four ton of, of oat hay. Uh, spring barley uh, and winter barley varieties, uh, great forage. Uh, they're using some of them for malting now. There is two row barley mainly designed for malting purposes. Uh, a lot of the other varieties are six row. You can see the difference here. Uh, fast growing in the fall, uh, grows really fast in the spring, has early maturity. It's probably mature uh, at least uh, 10 days to two weeks before rye would be. Uh, it suppresses weeds. It has lower biomass. Uh, the thing I like about barley is uh, we can actually roll barley uh, by the 15th or 20th of May, where we have to wait till about the end of May to roll the rye. We do up the seeding rate on the barley because it's only 12 to 22 inches tall. So we have to get a little more biomass out there. So you have to use more seed. Right. So, and again, the... The barley probably is the most similar to cereal rye for the amount of allelopathy uh, to suppress those small seeded broadleaf weeds and your winter annuals. Uh, barley does do best early seeded. So right around that uh, hessian fly date, uh, barley is susceptible to hessian fly. We don't seem to have too much pressure here. We'll plant barley in a mix in uh, early August without any problem. Uh, but again, we are not in a big wheat growing region. So we don't have a lot of hessian fly pressure that we need to worry about. Again, to look at the picture, the top picture is a two row type barley and the bottom a uh, six row type. So again, very good uh, early, as dad mentioned, uh, if you're gonna terminate mechanically with the roller crimper, it matches up well with crimson clover for maturity. So if you want to plant a, a two species combination for the spring, that would be good in front of corn. 
uh, crimson clover and barley mature at the same time and can both be mechanically terminated. So that's a good option. Barley can be a little bit more expensive than rye or oats. So you just have to look around. If you can find uh, someone with uh, barley that didn't pass malting grade, that's a good option uh, to look at seed there, as long as it was not the germination that got him knocked out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wheat and spelts, uh, you know, I'm not a great uh, uh, grower of wheat for cover crop. We grow it for a cash crop. So we're trying to keep the cash crop commodities separate from our cover crops. Uh, the disadvantage with wheat is it don't have the root mass that the rye or, or the barley has. Uh, uh, it tends to hold some soil moisture more in the ground than the other two uh, early spring. Uh, but if that's what you got, you know, it's, so it's better to have it there than have bare soils, you know. Right, because like we said, one of the key caveats is having live roots in the ground. Uh, and if, you know, you're in a place where wheat is what's the economical option that we have, it will protect against soil erosion. Uh, it will help compete against winter annual weeds from that standpoint. So that's uh, the benefit we have there. We know that, again, it's not as a hardy late seeded. Uh, although they're, they have, do have improved varieties from that standpoint. So uh, not the first one in our ranking, but sometimes, like I said, if you don't have wheat in your rotation, it does make a great companion uh, for increasing complexity in cover crop seed mixes. Especially where you're gonna grow soybeans after, you know. Uh, spelts, uh, I, really, I really like spelts if guys is calling and they ask about, well, you know, We've got a lot of cattle or we got uh, sheep or we got something like that. Uh, what would you prefer, wheat or spelts? I, I usually try to lean them to spelts because it has a wider leaf. Uh, the stem's a lot more digestible than the wheat stem is. Uh, and there's just, you know, the protein is probably three to four percent better than wheat, uh, especially if they're going to mow it, make hay out of it or pasture it early. We have a lot of guys that use spelts that they take it off for green chop and then plant corn or soybeans after that, you know. So actually they have two crops in one year. And of course, this is our favorite uh, uh, cereal rye, a long planting window, suppresses weeds. It really has deep roots. It was interesting, uh, four or five years ago, we dug some pits out here on the farm at a field day the rye was about five inches tall and the roots were 36 inches deep in the soil. I, I just, you know, the professor from uh, Maryland. Maryland just couldn't believe how deep the roots were. Uh, they talk about green bridge effect. I think when you're pushing this rye up to uh, 80 to 90 to 200 pounds, you probably have a little green bridge effect. And I think, and I'd rather say it's probably a nitrogen deficiency because the rye actually ties up the nitrogen that's left over from the crop before. Uh, you know, and I think uh, guys are looking at it and they forget that they should add about 10 or 15 pound of nitrogen at planting. If they do that, the, the corn plant never shows up yellow or anything wrong with it, it just continues to grow. Uh, it is a great host for armyworm if it's a wet, cold spring. Uh, you know, so you just have to do some management the neat thing about rye is when it's uh, uh, ankle high and it rains and it gets warm to the 60 degrees, it will grow out an inch of water a day out of the soil. So, you know, one day it can be too wet by morning of the next day. It may be too wet for the conventional guy, but the rye has grown out enough that you can plant. Now it does have a real high seed to end ratio, usually about uh, 60 to 80 to one nitrogen carbon to nitrogen. So that's why you have to add a little more nitrogen if you don't have legumes mixed with it, uh, if you're growing corn. But a great thing to tie up the nitrogen to grow soybeans. When we have rye like this in this picture, we can get about five or six bushel more beans just because of rye in the field. There's an example, and you say, this is where we like to see the rye. So dad is about six foot tall. 
this would probably be in that 30 to 50 pounds per acre range uh, that we commonly plant uh, our rye here. So that's what it looks like uh, in the spring. And that's the end of May, about the time we want to roll crimp uh, to terminate mechanically. And that's when we'll be planting corn. Are you, are you planting your soybeans prior to roller crimping or are you roller crimping then planting? Uh, we like to plant first and then roll afterwards. Uh, we found that if we, if we roll afterwards and uh, for some reason you didn't have the planter just set right or some of the seed trench is still open, you can roll that ride down over the seed trench. It'll help me close it up, keep moisture there. And we end up with about a 99 to 100% stand rolling afterwards versus about a 90% stand if you roll ahead of the time, you know. Yeah, we feel there's just a lot less interference with the crop standing, the cover crop standing with the planter unit. And it's just, uh, like I said, it just fixes a lot of problems rolling afterwards if you had run into some challenges with, especially closing the slot, things of that what, what's, uh, what's your window of error? I shouldn't say window of error. How long will you wait to roller crimp after planting? Or uh, can you wait? <clears throat> You know, it depends on the, well, if you're in the last of May, you know, you could probably wait three to four to five days before the actually uh, uh, the, the soybean plant or the corn plant actually starts to germinate. Uh, we like to roll just before it comes up or maybe just starting to spike on corn. And we'll try to have everything rolled by the first true leaf of soybeans. Right. And again, so, it talks about the type of crop. So if you're, if you're raising uh, a herbicide resistant crop, it's less of a concern. If you're organic or, no, or raising non-GMO crops like we are, generally we try to get it rolled and terminated uh, quickly after planting because we're planting into 60 degree soils and generally have you know three or four day emergence of the crop. So we need to get, if we're gonna apply herbicide, it needs to get done very soon after planting. Okay. I uh, had a couple questions come in here, and we'll start off with this one. Uh, what variety of rye do you use, which is a great question I was going to pop earlier. Let's talk a little bit of VNS versus variety stated. And uh, for those of you who may not know, VNS is variety not stated. So oh, looks like they had a slide that was coming up here. So we jumped it a little soon. But uh, yeah, go ahead with that. So this slide doesn't really cover the variety of rye that we carry, which is a Hazlitt, which is a, a Canadian variety. Uh, prior to Hazlitt, we were raising Prima, which is on this chart. And the chart kind of demonstrates that with different varieties of rye, you can have different dates of maturity. Now, this was at Iowa State, and Iowa State's not too far north of Ohio. So you see there's not a big difference in the maturity dates between the varieties. Aroostook was developed in Aroostook, Maine. Uh, Elbon is the reverse of the word noble. It was developed by the Noble Institute. Uh, and Primo is a Canadian rye again. Renza Bruzzi is actually uh, an heirloom grain from Italy that was brought over in the early 20th century. So, Again, we see a, a small variety in Iowa. If we get a little further north uh, in Wisconsin and into Canada, we can see as much as 10 days difference in maturity between a rustic and some of the uh, earlier or later maturing rye. So that can have a big thing. What's more going to impact, I think, performance of the rye is planting date. Uh, in general with, and you may find one that works better in your farm, uh, Prima is a smaller seeded rye, so you'll have an Elbon also. So you get a higher number of seeds per pound where you can then reduce your seeding rate. So that's another thing to look at when you purchase your rye is uh, if it states on there the seeds per pound and you can do some things that way. We like the, uh, the Hazlet rye as a larger plumper kernel and we feel we get much better uh, germination of the seed uh, from at least what we have grown. <laughs> and say. it tends to be a little bit shorter. Mm. It may be two or three inches shorter than these varieties here. Uh, there's nothing here on VNS, but if you use a VNS variety, 
most generally they'll have a combination of two or three different hybrids. So you could go from a heading date of the 17th of May to the 22nd of May in a VNS. So that makes it really difficult sometimes to terminate with mechanical till, mechanical roll, roll crop because some is in thesis that'll roll real well and stay down and then the rest of it will will not be so it springs back up, you know. All right, before I forget about this second question, uh, what would be a good seeding rate for a barley and crimson clover mix ahead of corn? So again, we, we talk about barley needing uh, probably 25 or 30% higher seeding rate than rye. Uh, so in front of corn, we like to keep rye around uh, 10 to 15 pounds. So we'd probably say 20 to 22 pounds of barley plus eight to 10 pounds of crimson clover to maximize nitrogen production from that standpoint. Yes. Uh, that, so that's, that's on the high end. Obviously you look at your economics for the cost of the seed and you can, you can dial that down to fit uh, that e economics. But the, generally we would think that that combination, the cost of that seed would be equivalent to the nitrogen <clears throat> input cost. So you could replace one with the other. So would the, would the nitrogen benefit of the crimson clover be sufficient enough in that short of time to spend the money on crimson clover in your mix if you're planting it, let's say, after wheat, uh, getting ready for your corn crop going into the next year? I, I really think you can count on uh, that crimson clover if it's got it in before winter, you know, and it got up a couple inches tall and you let it go to, uh, to head where it makes that nice uh, uh, red steeple, uh, you can pick up about 72 to 85 pounds of nitrogen just from the crimson clover. So, you know, at, at today's prices at a buck a pound, yeah, I guess it's reasonable to put crimson clover in, you know. Uh, this chart kind of tells you a little bit of the story about how risky, well, I won't say risky, but what you can see if you get the, the rye big or too thick in a cornfield where we're planting a grass upon a grass. Uh, Iowa State says that, uh, that they've seen as, you know, up to 25 bushel loss and also a seven to eight bushel gain. So it just depends on what you're trying to do and how it works. If you move over to the low risk side, which is soybeans, and that's where I really like to see rye being used. You know, if we're in the corn side, we're gonna be at 10 to 15 pound of rye, and there's, you will not have a, a 25 or a 20. You won't have any yield loss from the rye with that seeding rate that low. Uh, I think Iowa State was running this at 72 pounds or something like that uh, when they did this study. Uh, in the soybeans, look what we found. They found uh, a few uh, plots they had was a three bushel loss, but most of them gained bushels with rye in the soybean year, you know. And, you know, they're showing about a seven or eight bushel yield increase uh, as an average, you know. And we'd say that even if you look at like uh, the Bex crop report manual uh, for several years, they showed in their plots where they had cereal rye in front of soybeans, an average of a five bushel yield advantage following cereal rye. They probably didn't let it get too big. Yeah, you know, you look, you're looking at uh, from 12 to $16 an acre cost, not including getting it out there. That's just the cost of the seed. So if you can pick up five bushel and it's worth eight dollars, you know it's, that's a pretty good return on your investment. So if, if I may add quickly on my own experience with uh, cereal rye in front of corn, um, I've been doing that for ten years now. Um, but I've in the past been the normal guy that is in April I'm spraying it when it's really small, you know, uh, making sure it's not hitting me. Two thousand and twenty. I let the rye grow and I planted into growing rye, was unable to terminate. We got rained out of that field. 
and uh, it, it just beat that corn crop up. And we didn't front load a weed and feed nitrogen source. We went in and we applied all of our side dress early, hoping that would help us, but uh, it didn't. So if you're going to do something like that, you definitely want to go with a 15, we went with a 15 gallon weed and feed over the top. Yes, and that's yes. what we did this year. We sprayed Roundup uh, our glyphosate on top of it prior to planting to make sure it was terminated first. And then we went in with uh, 15 gallons of a weed and I'm sorry, 15 gallons on the planter and a two by two by two. But then we went with a 20 gallon over the top weed and feed and uh, had a phenomenal corn crop this year, which I'm sure a lot of people did um, in our area, at least. And uh, it worked out great. So it's n it's not something to be afraid of in front of the corn. You just need to take that extra step of management if you're going to put it in front of corn. And I believe we did get a yield increase with having the rye out there, holding the moisture and uh, releasing that nitrogen later in the season when we got so hot, you know, it wasn't disappearing. It was actually coming from the, uh, the rye crop. Right. Very good, Shane. And we mentioned before about the importance of the planting date or the benefit of the earlier planting date. So this chart here just shows three different planting dates just in October alone from the 1st to the 30th relating to nitrogen uptake from soil sampling. Uh, so we see here again how much greater that October 1st planting date is on nitrogen uptake where it took up 140 pounds of nitrogen by the, the subsequent March 15th date where the late October 30th planting just got up to about 60, 65 pounds of nitrogen. So again, that ability to sequester nutrients and outcompete winter annuals or spring annuals for that fertility really gets you ahead of the game and helps with that weed suppression, minimizing any uh, additional herbicide costs you may need that year. Mm -hmm. So again, we talk about the scientific basis for cover crops. Again, this was back from the early 2000s, right, where we're looking at uh, these gentlemen that did this study, uh, looking at a control, which would be no cover crop versus a rye cover crop, talking about uh, flow-weighted nitrate loss out of uh, drainage tile, just showing a weighted average across three years. And you can see the, the big decrease in those nitrates through the drainage tile. Uh, in each of those years and on average in general, uh, almost a third or two thirds less nitrate loss uh, from your crop ground. This is a study Rick Clark did and I, I borrowed the slide from him and I really thought it was interested because, uh, you know, he looked at 12 inch tall rye uh, and terminated it. So, you know, he found, uh, you can read the figures there. I won't bore you with all, all what I'm going to say, other than I'm just going to move you over to the biomass. And 12 inch tall rye here had about 2,000 pounds of biomass. If we let it go to 18 inches tall, look at the amount of nitrogen that plant accumulated between 12 and 18. You know, it picked up uh, 40 pounds almost, mm -hmm. 38 pounds to be exact, you know, picked up a little more phosphorus. Uh, picked up a good bit of potash, uh, you know, and his biomass went to 4,000 pounds. You know, and if we look at 28 inches tall where Rick terminates a lot of it and ours is even twice that tall, uh, uh, you know, he was up to 134 pounds of nitrogen and he had 6,800 pounds of biomass. But I thought the real interesting thing was the next line where the rye was dead for uh, at least 30 days, some of it 45 when he pulled a sample of the biomass, he still found 84 or 84 pound of nitrogen. They still had 3,500 pound of biomass on the surface. So he still had enough biomass uh, six weeks after termination of these shorter crops that will allow him to have uh, soil cover, slow down water impact from a raindrop, and also be able to keep it from eroding. So I thought that was a great slide that Rick had put together. And again, it shows the concept of the residue 
releasing those uh, nutrients back to the, the soil and the plants. And, and, and that's what I was going to say. Let, let's make sure and note that a nutrient going through a, uh, an animal or a plant is far more readily available to the next growing plant. So this, this is not removed nutrients. This is used nutrients that will be returned back to the soil and it'll be even more readily available for your cash crop. Yes. Yep. Um, I do have another question. I'll let you guys answer this uh, on what you think. Um, is it best to have a starter system on the planter to be able to plant corn green and apply nitrogen at planting? Yes. Yes. I think, I think it's a benefit. I don't think it's a must have though. No, it's not a must have, but it is a small benefit. It, right. it, it, it is a benefit, but you can acquire almost the same results if you're willing to go a high rate of weed and feed. Um, yes. Because that nitrogen on the weed and feed will not be lost um, um, to exposure to the elements. It will almost immediately be absorbed by your rye plant, and then yes. it, it will be or put back into your soil at a further date. So uh, I don't think that it's a must have. Uh, I don't know if I would go out and spend a, a lot of money to add that to your system. Um, if you have a co-op or yourself is able to do a high rate of a weed and feed. Yes. So here we're, this is our 20 foot crop roller. We pull it with a 30, 20. Uh, my wife loves to do that. Uh, so uh, she's done it in the past. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this just gives you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, you know, she's rolling about seven mile an hour with this. Uh, the corn's been planted, and we're rolling her down. At this at this stage, we, as you can see, it pretty well lays down. Some of it springs up just a little bit. Uh, this field that we did at this time saved us the first primary uh, herbicide pass. Uh, we did come back and treat with a little 2,4-D, sort of some broad leaves that came up uh, when the corn was about knee high. But you can see how nice that roller rolls that down and crimps it. Uh, you can do it with a collar packer, it just won't crimp it, it might not lay down as nice. Uh, there's, you know, there's all kinds of ways you can get this accomplished. And of course, some of these are showing you legumes with our rye. And uh, these fields here, you're seeing a roller in, we use no extra nitrogen, we just plant the corn and let her grow. So here we've, uh, this was a field that had uh, almost 40,000 pounds of green biomass. It was about seven and a half foot tall. In order to have it so that we didn't keep shearing, shear pins on the marker arms, uh, we rolled ahead of it. As you can see, we're planting against the way it was rolled and not having any trouble. Uh, once you get it laid down, it's not a problem to run that corn planter through it, you know. When generally, when you have legumes that are vining legumes like uh, peas or uh, veg, uh, a single stand of rye, when you run against the grain, you have issue with it maybe bunching up underneath the planter. So you have to be careful and watch your conditions from that standpoint. So generally we wanna go uh, with uh, the grain if we roll in front of the planter right. with, a, with a solid stand of rye. In a mix, uh, you can do uh, cross grain for sure. We probably only roll about 10 or 15 acres a year ahead of the planter. Well, I'd say 92% of all our ground gets rolled after we plant. Is there any attachments that uh, don't work well? with rolling, uh, say, uh, spiked closing wheels, drag chains? Spiked closing wheels, uh, uh, curved cl uh, closing wheels, uh, you know, anything that it'll catch on, it'll catch on, and uh, it's a problem. Our planter just has a fluted colder, and we're running rubber press wheels, not cast iron. Uh, our ground is mellow enough that the rubber wheels will close it. Uh, and this is just a shot of this, uh, in one year where the cover crop never got big enough to roll. So, you know, sometimes you just have to change 
your total mindset. And that's why we talk about management. Uh, you got to be willing to change what you're going to do. We had planned to roll this. I'm not using herbicide, but uh, it was a late spring. It was cold clear up till the 15th day of May. I think this was done on the 25th day of May. Uh, the stuff was about 12 and a half inches tall. So here we did have to use a burn down and use a residual herbicide because we just did not have enough biomass to roll and not enough biomass to hold the weeds down. Uh, this is uh, uh, with legumes and uh, grasses and you can see how that colder cut it. It really, you know, our colders do a nice job and so do the disc blades. And we're planting a seed about an inch and a half deep. We're running about 30,000 soybean or corn plants and about 125 to 130 seeds per acre on a soybeans. Go ahead, Jay. And you can see how it's cut the residue uh, and actually closed up the trench fairly well. And here is the results. The neat thing about having covers is uh, the ground will be cooler during the summer. Here you can see the cover crop field with the corn coming up in it. Uh, this is two weeks after the neighbor had done his conventional corn or three weeks. We're at 78 and he's at the 92 or 93, I think, 91. And you can see how crusty his soil is. You can also see if you look at his corn plant on the very tips, he's starting to show nitrogen deficiency. And I know that he had applied anhydrous ammonia ahead of this, so I'm assuming there's 230 or 240 pound of nitrogen been applied already to this corn. Some years are great. This is in, in 17, the cover crop got big. You can see how it's laying it down. We come in with a crop roller, but in 18, we just had that cool spring and didn't get the cover up. So you have to learn to manage and adjust uh, we probably use a crop roller 80% of the time. There'll be just two years out of 10 that you're going to have to use a herbicide to actually terminate your covers. Other times the roller can do it. We like to plant big as Jay says, and here we're planting soybeans and standing rye. Rolling afterwards. <clears throat> There comes the beans. These beans had no herbicide in 13. They had six, 42 pound of rye planted in the fall in corn and they averaged 72 bushel. So we get into <clears throat> the options because we talk about low risk with soybeans with cover crops. So there's been a broad adoption in uh, the no-till organic uh, venue from utilizing these techniques. Uh, we've been real fortunate, as we mentioned before, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison has really been a champion on this, as well as uh, Jeff Moyer down at the Rodale Institute. <clears throat> Clearly two different type of agronomic situations between southeastern Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. But again, similar performance properties that they see. The key factors when we're looking at trying to do a, a no-till organic or a no herbicide type soybean program is we want to start with a clean field. Obviously, uh, if you're starting with less weed pressure, you have less weeds to worry about. We want to get that rye planted in early October uh, at around the Hessian uh, fly free date or even two weeks earlier. Uh, rye is not suspect to or a carrier of a Hessian fly. Uh, so generally, we try to get as early as possible to get that because uh, the rye is going to tiller in the fall more than in the spring. So the amount of biomass that we can produce uh, is increased here by this early planting. Again, for weed suppression in a no herbicide situation, two to three bushels per acre of the rye, right? So we're talking at least 112 uh, to 160 pounds of grain to plant. We're looking for this magic number of this 8,000 pounds per acre of biomass for weed control. 
It's most effective, again, against small seeded weeds. And we have <clears throat> uh, reduced control of late summer or large seeded weeds, primarily because at that time we've got soil temperatures working against us, as well as the decomposition of the mulch that allows sunlight to the soil and promotes germination for those problematic late summer weeds. This amount, this 8,000 pounds of biomass, can produce a four to six inch thick mulch on the surface, which can lead to challenges with seeding equipment if we're not careful. So again, the rye needs to be an antithesis or post antithesis for optimum rolling conditions, which is the milk or dough stage of the grain. Uh, variety in this case can definitely make a difference based on your timing. And again, that unevenness of maturity across the field. Lodging can be uh, an issue, especially with uh, late spring uh, storms that come through and tend to lay it down. Again, if you're in a high fertility situation, we would expect to see a much higher biomass, a lot taller plants and a more likelihood for them to fall over. So guys that are applying a lot of manure on their fields would tend to see a lot more lodging than otherwise. We mentioned a rustic as one of the earlier ones. There's some newer ones from uh, North Dakota. I think uh, the ND Gardener is also supposed to be in this two to 14 days earlier maturity. If you're looking for a quality uh, certified seed source, uh, those can provide that benefit. And uh, on a logic thing, if you are on a high level manure application like big dairies or big hog operations and they're putting a lot on and you're trying to go organic, then I'd cut back my seeding rate because that'll tend to make the plants bigger around in diameter, the stems, and they will stand a little better. You know, uh, that seems to be, you know, we need to have that, but you know, with good manure levels, the plants are gonna get bigger than if it, if you had no livestock manure on them. For sure. So here we have a picture of rye in antithesis. So you see the yellow uh, anthers, which is where the pollination occurs for the grain. So we want to make sure that we see that minimum, right, 90%, but we would prefer to have even some uh, seed development, like we say in that milk stage, just to make sure we have that hollow stem of the plant and we're able to mechanically crimp that to terminate. So here we have an example from uh, Joel Groover out in Western Illinois University in some of the plots that they did looking at this no-till organic system. So we started in 2009 with their program and they had plots that ranged in uh, yield from 51 to 58 bushels per acre, which is pretty good in a conventional managed system, right? Uh, in this year, they had a good growing year and saw very little difference between no-till, conventional till, and in this bio strip till system they were working on. As they progress uh, into the next field, right, in their rotation, here because of the soil quality index, they see a lot of foxtail pressure, but basically no broadleaf weeds. So we talk about that allelopathy of the rye, how it suppresses the broadleaf weeds, uh, so they did see a depressed yield because of that foxtail pressure in this, but still 42 to 52 bushel with the only input cost being the seeding of the cereal rye uh, gives you a pretty decent return yeah. on investment. The next year, uh, the no-till bean plots yielded 10 bushel better than their best tillage system plots as they get into better management practice. And in 22 or 2012, uh, their no-till bean yields ranged 30 to 60 bushels per acre based on because they were in parts of the farm that had some fairly odd drainage systems, right? So they were noticing that the rye uh, did improve uh, drainage in one of the wet holes they had. So again, some of those management uh, things that you notice in the farm as you progress. Uh, so again, they're looking at, in this case, a very high seeding rate and getting them these really excellent yields uh, in a no-till situation without any uh, additional inputs and herbicide, you know, it's over 60 bushel yield is pretty good. 
And then here, uh, finally, uh, in this year, they had uh, 70 bushel per acre yield in that no-till organic system. So these things are achievable. Uh, and here, again, it's on a smaller scale, but again, field scale, opportunity here at Western Illinois to show that example. So again, for those that are into other crops, right, this can be done on a smaller scale for vegetable producers. Uh, we again we sell these uh, crop rollers from INJ Manufacturing, and they'll make them any size from three foot, actually uh, twenty foot, twenty inches, up to sixty foot wide. So all kinds of configurations are available uh, from that standpoint. Like I say, any any kind of roller. This had to be an old call to packer, and this is before we ever knew anything about INJ Manufacturing. <laughs> and this is our garden plot, and we grow pumpkins. Melons, gourds, squashes, green beans, and tomatoes into a rye cover. And this will show you some of our tomatoes. Uh, we do lay black plastic. We shouldn't have because it was never turned on during the growing season where the rye was. In our conventional, we had to irrigate every day in August to keep them tomatoes alive. Uh, Different ways we can get cover crops introduced. Uh, there's a lot of movement now to think about doing uh, uh, interseeding into corn when it's uh, from like eight or nine inches tall up to uh, to tossel. Depends on what kind of machinery you got. And this just happens to be a Weilmeyer air seeder uh, with uh, two disc units between the rows. Right, so in this practice here, uh, we generally like to see earlier is generally better for getting that crop established so that as the corn canopies, uh, we have a very vigorous plant. If we're later, closer to the V8, which would be your late interseeding timeframe, uh, you have to have a very vigorous crop to get out of the ground and be established where that lack of sunlight doesn't cause it to self-terminate during the year, but this is a very effective way. These units can run up to 10 miles an hour and can cover quite a bit of ground. Uh, the benefit of having a seeding unit is that seed to soil contact. Uh, we know broadcasting, a lot of guys have these rigs set up uh, just to broadcast. Again, these row units are very expensive. So uh, a 30 foot wide uh, piece of equipment can run you in excess of $60,000 uh, just because of those row units. So. Eliminating that expense and just having fifteen or twenty thousand dollars in a toolbar and a seed box gets you to apply cover crops early uh, and get it done in a timely fashion. But you'll have to increase the seeding rates if you're not going to use a direct seed method, probably by as much as ten to fifteen percent, depending on the species. Correct? Depending on the species, right? Yeah. And so in the early interseeding, we're going to look at annual ryegrass. From that standpoint, generally the corn canopy is going to cause cereal crops to self-terminate. Yes. Oats might be the next most vigorous, <clears throat> but it's still a challenge, especially if you get dry, to survive that canopy. So generally for the small grains, we're going to say we use uh, our number two option, which is to come in at tassel or preferably in late August, uh, because we know as we get into September, we have more reliable rain uh, and moisture availability. And that timing works out very well. Uh, the high voice seeder is very reliable to get those seed down into the, the crop canopy and have very good establishment for broadcast seed. So here we can run uh, rye or barley, uh, any of those small grains, along with you know radish and some clovers, depending on what you're trying to do uh, with your crop there. And especially you know if you're going to be grazing the, the corn stalks, that provides a great opportunity for animal health and, and nutrition. And the other advantage of this late interseeding is we have that root system now established uh, that provides that uh, less compaction as we drive our harvesting equipment over the ground where we can, as we know, get into some waterlogged characteristics in our harvest season. Uh, the neat thing about this machine is it covers 36 rows at a time. Uh, it can blow a lot of different species at a fairly economical rate. Uh, if you had corn planted with guidance, it's a lot more fun. Uh, if you had not just used a marker arm and you got uh, a few zigs and zags, uh, it makes it a little more difficult. 
There's the results of what we do with the high boy cedar. Here you can see uh, uh, the, the uh, cereal rye. Uh, there's reddishes there, there's crimson clover there, there's hairy vetch growing. Uh, we like to use a blended plant. Uh, and uh, this corn, the bottom four leaves were brown when we was in there and it came really well. And you can also, I mean, not to skip over the airplane, uh, airplanes can be very reliable as long as it's around a good rainfall. We feel we find generally we get uh, with an airplane one good uh, crop out of every three years or maybe even yeah. more, maybe five. Yeah. Just because of the variability of weather and be able to timing it with good rainfall. That's why we like uh, the high boy applicator just seems to be a little bit more reliable uh, for that the late season interceding. <coughs> Any questions about the small grains, uh, Shane, that have popped up before we get into Yeah, that? I, I did have a couple of uh, smaller, I shouldn't call them smaller questions, but uh, are you guys familiar with the uh, STP opener blades? Yes. Yeah. A, a very aggressive opener blade. Uh, the One of the questions is, what do you think is better, a no-till coulter, like a wavy coulter, or the STP opener blades? Yeah. Uh, I guess I like a I like a wavy colder. Uh, you know, the STT blades will work really well. A lot of guys we run a uh, we we would not run a colder if it wasn't for our rocks. We would put those uh, blades on the seed opener. Uh, they're heavier. Uh, the things I've heard it from people saying that they're not wearing as well as they thought they might. But uh, you know they are really a great uh, slicer. They slice the soil well. Uh, but in our case, we have to have that fluted colder out there to pick to protect our seed unit because uh, we just have too many rocks at uh, inch and a half to two inches deep that just uh, thump the crap out of the seed unit. Yeah. yeah, so we're right on the edge of the, the glacial till, so we have all the, the pebbles that fell out of the great glacier here. So it's not as bad as some other people, but uh, with the, being a no-till practice, uh, we still have a good healthy rock population. So. We do have, there are some rather big names in the ag industry running those STP blades. And it's gonna come down to a lot of planter attachments. What you like and performance for you uh, should do well. Uh, for us, for our practice, uh, our standard double disc opener has worked very well with that leading coulter. Yes. And I will say on our, on our drill, uh, we're running a leading notched disc uh, and then a smaller a smooth disc behind it without any leading coulter. And those work just fine. Yeah, going through the cereal rye as well. So all those configurations do work very well. Okay. Uh, the last question I've got here for now is, is there any secrets besides timing of rolling to keep pollen and anthers from clogging the radiator of the planting tractor or the rolling tractor? Uh, the best thing we found is you double uh, window screened and put it around the front of the tractor. Well, that really seems to help protect it, you know, to, from getting in the radiator and plugging the radiator. Uh, you will have to stop, blow it out, blow it out probably every, at lunchtime and then at supper time if you're going to keep going, you know, but it'll run four or five hours without any problems usually. Yeah, you could put a, a leading bar out front. So if you've got a rock box or something, and you could just run, uh, say, a, a T-post out in front to lay it over so it shakes the, the dust out in front and not so close to the tractor. That will help out, too. Those are a couple I've seen. All right. Well, Talking about well, warm season grasses now, uh, they have their place. Most warm season grasses should be planted uh, in late July, uh, first of August, uh, we really see a big advantage to these plants because they grow very rapidly. They take very little moisture. They love hot weather. And this gives us the ability to have a cool season grass mixed with a warm season grass. So if, if it's 100 degrees, we're going to get warm season grass to grow. If it's an 80 degree summer, our, our cool season grasses are going to do better. So we're kind of, I hate to say this out loud, but we're trying to fool Mother Nature and put something out there that's going to grow no matter what she throws at us, you know. 
Yep. So we'll start with uh, TEF uh, is an annual forage. Uh, we generally don't promote TEF as a cover crop because of the difficulty in establishment, especially for no-till. Uh, TEF usually takes uh, kind of like an alfalfa, okay. wants a very smooth, uh, well uh, fractured uh, substrate to be planted into very shallow. So it's a, it's a challenge in no-till. TEF is a fabulous forage though, if you get it established properly and with a huge root system, will really build back that soil after that heavy disturbance to get it uh, in that mellow field. So not a great one, we don't think, but again, if you're considering something in uh, mixed add diversity in a warm season paddock, uh, this would be something to consider just because of the quality of forage. Pearl millet is one of our favorite of the larger millets, uh, mainly because of uh, quick growth and many tillers. So we have great uh, canopy with these plants. They're great companions, uh, high uh, seeds per pound, so very low seeding rates. So we have a very good economy uh, on seed usage here. Uh, it is a winter kill plant being a warm season grass. So really the first whiff of uh, Frost is going to take it out. The other, for those grazers, uh, pearl millet does not carry the prussic acid. So even after frost, it's safe to graze. Proso millet is a low growing warm season grass. Very quick, uh, great for wildlife. Uh, again, if you're interested in uh, double crop opportunities and have a market for proso millet, there's that opportunity as well. But, a few and far between here, uh, most of it in Colorado, it's a staple crop though, so. Other grass millets that you could consider would be a German or foxtail millet, as well as Japanese millet. These are generally double crop hay type millets uh, because of their quick growth and high forage quality of the leaves. Uh, once they get to maturity, you see in the picture here, uh, there's, it's pretty tough. Animals don't like it here because it's very stemmy. But uh, in, the, in the vegetative stage, uh, very high quality hay. Uh, it does make for some interesting uh, plants in a big mixture, especially if you're uh, rolling from small grains like wheat crop into soybeans the next year, a good way to pull up any excess nutrient and uh, outcompete weeds in the summer. Sudan grass uh, is one of those forage grasses that came up from the south. Very tall uh, plant. Uh, it does not have the leaf structure of some other ones in there, but again, because of its quick regrowth after cutting is highly preferred. Uh, you get uh, very high quality forage when it's cut in the vegetative stage and is also very good in a pasture mix uh, for grazing. There are types that have a BMR trait. The BMR is for the brown midrib on the leaf and it does have lower lignin content. So its decomposition is faster. Also the nutrient absorption in the rumen is faster, which is what it's promoted for. And if you mow it several times, each time you mow it, the roots go deeper. So you can enhance the root depth by either grazing it or mowing it off uh, a time or two during the time you're trying to grow it. And you want to mow six inches or higher right. so that you don't cut off the growth node and terminate it. So sorghum sudan grass is that hybrid between sorghum and sudan grass. There are so many different varieties that have been developed for uh, people harvesting this for silage based on their type of cropping practice. Uh, the, full, the, the thing that we could look for uh, we generally sell a full season type of sorghum sedan grass because that's generally the most economical. Uh, delayed maturity one is one that won't put on much of a seed head until very late in the season. So a late or mid-August planted <clears throat> plant is likely not to develop any seed. Again, we have a BMR trait that can aid in residue decomposition or improve digestibility if you're harvesting it. Rachitic just means that it's going to tiller more, it's shorter and has more leaf area. Dad already mentioned the excellent root system for sorghum sedan grass, highly prized as a cover crop for that feature. And again, as we mentioned, if it is mowed 
or grazed, you can double the amount of root surface area and really improve highly degraded or compacted soils. So if we look at these warm season forages, this is a good example of those mature stalk diameters. On the left, we have the Sudan grass varieties showing the sorghum sedan grass in the center and the pearl millet to the right. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the mature plants are going to look like. Sorghum, again, you have grain, forage, and wildlife types. Uh, grain sorghum is going to be very short, generally three to four foot max. Uh, the forage is going to be intermediate in height, up to seven to eight feet. And there's some wildlife type sorghums that grow 14 feet tall. So it's generally they're very good as a companion in mixes and very good for grazing, high quality grazing. Corn can be used again as a cover crop. <laughs> we did see this promoted during some uh, uh, prevent plant. Yeah. Uh, again, at high populations, you're gonna get finer stems. Uh, and again, with excellent canopy that corn provides, you can offer some uh, weed suppression from that standpoint. But again, we don't generally promote cage crops as cover crops uh, unless you know, the situation occurs where it's the most economical way to go. Again, the warm season grasses offer this forage and grazing opportunity, a very high quality forage, provides the opportunity for cattle producers to maintain daily average gains in that three to four pounds per day in the heat of the summer. So that's an excellent uh, way to do it. So here's an example again of that height that you can look at with the sorghum sedan grass. <laughs> so you can see it's growing at least two foot over dad. So at least eight to nine foot tall here in this example. So I believe we did a biomass sample on this field and it had somewhere upwards of 50 to 60,000 pounds of biomass yes. in this field. So this is that field then in the winter after a couple of freezes. The nice thing about the warm season grasses is that they stay elevated above the soil. So you do get uh, aeration in the spring where it doesn't stay as wet as if it does lay down. The only disadvantage we have here is that we've created a natural habitat for rodents. So that's something that can become an issue. And it's not something that occurs every year. We generally see a build over subsequent years and then we see a colony collapse. So nothing unusual that happens in nature. Uh, we just need to be aware of this. Uh, one way to help uh, get rid of that is to have perches for birds of prey, uh, to keep your tree lines intact, and to not shoot all the coyotes. So those are practices that we employ on our farm. So we've generally told no coyote hunters are allowed on our property anymore, and we don't have problems with groundhogs or very much with rodents in our experience. So the crop roller helps a little bit with that too. Yeah, if you got lots of them, the crop roller will take a bunch of them out. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is what we're looking for in our practice to utilize, especially the, the large root systems from these grasses, whether it be cool season or warm season. Here on our farm, we transitioned this yellow Carrington clay soil. We took harvested this ped back in 1971 and to what it was in 2014, uh, somewhere around five to 7% organic matter, you know, almost uh, a 500% increase in fertility, just following these practices with crop rotation and utilization of cover crops. So we'll kind of end uh, what we had here with this little saying showing uh, the 60 foot crop roller from uh, Howard Buffett. <laughs> uh, so at the end of the day, right, we want to protect our asset, the soil, right, and how we develop this system approach in our crop management systems. So any questions, again, that we have, love to entertain them. I'm not seeing any come up. You guys are more than welcome to unmute yourself if you want to ask anything. <clears throat> Okay, um, well, I've added in the chat here real quick. Uh, I know we've lost some people. This is went a little 
longer than what uh, I'm sure any of us anticipated. But as you can see, there's a lot of knowledge between these two. And uh, I'm sure there's just so much that we didn't even touch on. Um, so I've added just a couple of resources here. First off, I put uh, Walnut Creek Seeds uh, um, website. So their contact information is there. Um, you are uh, more than welcome to contact Jay, Dave, or Ann um, with any questions. Um, I've also added a SARE has a uh, managing cover crops properly um, PDF. Um, it's a great resource. Uh, I'd love to pull it up and share my screen a little bit, but it's like 200 pages long. Um, it's a great resource to look at. It really is. Um, uh, please download that, uh, flip through it a little bit. I've also added the uh, periodical table that the NRCS has put with the cover crops. Um, and uh, I've also added my email address if anybody would like to contact me. Again, uh, this is through the farmer advocacy uh, program through the nature, or yeah, the, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm fumbling over my words right now. But the farmer advocate program through the Nature Conservancy Agency, and uh, they they've helped with this program with me getting out there. Um, they've also got more programs that they are um, going to be doing with this farmer. Uh, program here. So if you're interested in that, look up Stephanie Singer or the Nature Conservancy um, to help you out there. Uh, also, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's why I left my email there. Um, I work a lot with Dave and Jay here, so I'd be help, uh, happy to mediate any questions that you have. Um, again, uh, this did go a little longer than what I anticipated myself. Uh, hopefully you'll all join us next time, uh, in, next month and tone it back a little bit. We'll hit another subject and, uh, we'll go from there. Hopefully I won't be piping in on too many questions that you guys don't want to hear the answers to anyway, but, uh, I love, uh, taxing these guys' minds. Uh, they're very smart. They've been doing it for a long time. So thank you. Thank you very much for being part of this, Dave and Jay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, we do have another question here. How do you deal with volunteer rye when you want to plant that particular field to wheat? <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a challenge. Uh, if you if terminate it at early milk stage or uh, anthesis, you won't have a problem uh, because nine times out of 10, all the hard seed is already sprouted from the spring and you've taken them out, you know. Right, so if, we, if you have rye in your wheat, uh, it's a bigger challenge. Um, there are some tools you could use uh, because the rye would grow taller than the wheat. So uh, there's a tool called the comb cut, which would be a tool with uh, razor knives on it that would cut the rye heads off. Uh, there are other tools. I know guys have like rotary cutters that mount on the front of a tractor that you can keep above the uh, wheat canopy to, again, to chop those things off. And, or you could have a, a rope applicator with uh, Gravoxone, right? And you could terminate it that way, hopefully before it puts the seed head on, right? So those are what we know of and have seen guys do. I have heard that there may be, uh, in the younger stages, some other selective herbicides that might work, but I don't know of anything any names that I could say to it specifically for that. So especially if we have there's, there's uh, some herbicide tolerant varieties uh, that they've worked out for uh, particular grass species uh, in wheat out in the Western states. Uh, so those are some things maybe to investigate, uh, but we haven't seen anything effective out here yet on that. But as we move down the road in the next year or two with this hybrid rye that we're growing, uh, they claim some of this rye will not make a seed head the second year you plant it. So that would be the time that would, would be for cover crop and it has a dormant head on it. So that might be an alternative. It's a little more expensive than regular cereal rye, but if you're in a wheat program, it may be worth that extra dollar or so for a bushel of hybrid rye versus regular rye, you know. 
they're telling us anyhow. It has to be proved yet. It hasn't been proved yet. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> So there was one question early on. Uh, I don't believe the gentleman's on here anymore, but he asked, will you talk about which herbicides will ding these grasses? Um, and then I, I, I'm going to go on a limb thinking he's like residual. Is there any residual that you should want to stay away from when, when uh, applying this prior to seeding the, the grasses? Uh -huh. Anything with a long residual, yeah. you'll want to stay away from, you know, uh, because they will dig the grasses, even though they were put on in early spring, you know. Right. So it's it's really about paying attention to label restrictions and plant back on, for small grain from that. Uh, as we build uh, soil health and organic matter, again, we can uh, tolerate uh, some of these herbicides a lot better because the... the microbes in the soil convert them away so they don't do as much damage. So uh, obviously we have to look at those plant back restrictions for small grains on the herbicides. And I know a lot of the names escape us because <laughs> we don't use a lot of long residual herbicides in our, our program. So we're not as familiar with them, but things I know like Fomasafen is one that is really restrictive if you use it late in the season. Uh, and I think most of the trouble we have sees with carryover on broadleaves uh, that ding the clover and the radish more than anything else. Um, Dual and Banville uh, applied, or you know, like guys with uh, sweet corn programs. Uh, a lot of the herbicides they use in the sweet corn programs can make it difficult to establish cover crops uh, after sweet corn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say make sure and look at the labels. Uh, yeah. They're, they're ever-changing. Uh, the products are ever-changing. I know we talk about a lot of them. We hear about the, a lot of them over and over and over again, but there's so many generics out there and stuff like that. Uh, really look at your labels and uh, follow the small grain restrictions when it comes to something that's got a residual. Um, it's very good information. Um so other than that, I'm looking here on a couple. There are some direct messages saying uh, excellent presentation. Learn so much. Thank you very much. So um, I, I do feel like this was very informative. I've, even talking with you guys for the three years that I've been talking with you, I've learned so much and there's so much information that I know you didn't even put out there because we'd be here for another four hours. After <laughs> yeah. So thank Thank you again, um, and hopefully we see you guys next month. Uh, okay. We'll try to post this recording somewhere. Uh, I will try and email you guys with uh, these uh, these downloads that I've had before. Um, I'll try and lead you to where the um, where this recording can be viewed at a later date if you had to get off early or something. So thank you very much for attending, and hopefully we'll see you next month. Good enough. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Hi, Steph. Hi. I do have, you know, right now, well, I'm going to stop the recording, but I do have um, 